I don't know if you've ever watched a two and a half year old hold his or her breath. They will sometimes hold their breath until they pass out. So it is that I'm going to get my way and then they pass out. That's the silent treatment in an adult. I'm not getting my way. I'm not going to talk. It's a tantrum. So let's talk about the silent treatment. It is so frustrating. Okay. If you've ever been through it, you're like, oh, I know what you're talking about. The silent treatment is definitely one of the key weapons in the narcissist's arsenal. So the silent treatment is exactly what it sounds like. Now, let's give me give you, I'll give you an example. One day, perhaps you have an argument with somebody narcissistic or difficult in your life, or maybe that you issue a small criticism, or they just didn't like something you said or did. That happens, and they just stop talking to you. They just stop. Now, if you don't live with them, they may stop answering any communications and may stop responding and stop reaching out. If you do live with them, they will live in silence with you. And if you talk to them, they will either ignore you or if it is essential, they may say something. At best, they'll give you a one word answer. Yes, no, over there. Or they'll engage in a verbal gesture. Hey, you'll say, hey, where's the keys? And they will then put the keys in front of you and walk away without a word. Now, if you have ever lived with any of this, you know it. And it is miserable. You would almost just rather have the fight and not deal with this. It is an uncomfortable and very difficult way to live. And it's always kind of hanging over your head, this idea that, oh my gosh, the silent treatment is going to come again. So let's talk about the five classical reasons for the silent treatment. The first reason, the first reason is stonewalling or manipulation. In other words, what they're doing is they're using the silent treatment as a way to maybe draw out an apology, to punish you, to get you to do something that they mo may want to do um, or want you to do. So it's very much this, by stonewalling you, the reason it's considered to be a form of manipulation is because then it becomes a way of using their silence almost as a sort of a source of power of sorts. So that is one reason that they do engage in the silent treatment. It just becomes a manifestation of stonewalling with the result of manipulation. And then you end up behaviorally doing something they want, or in essence, they kind of almost get their needs met. The second thing that is seen within the silent treatment is gaslighting. What we can sometimes see is that they will, when somebody gives you the silent treatment, it almost feels as though your reality is being absolutely denied. You are in a room and you're with a person and they are not talking to you. And you're thinking, is this really happening? And then you might even start blaming yourself. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. This is my fault. Let me, and instead of seeing that the silent treatment is completely unacceptable, you may actually start twisting your reality in a way that you're blaming yourself and that in some way this silent treatment can actually feel like it becomes acceptable. It's not. A third element that is at play in stonewalling is that it's a manifestation of an emotional immaturity or really like a lack of interpersonal skill. When you think about what the silent treatment is, I don't know if you've ever watched a two and a half year old hold his or her breath. They will sometimes hold their breath until they pass out. So it is that I'm going to get my way and then they pass out. That's the silent treatment in an adult. I'm not getting my way. I'm not going to talk. It's a tantrum. It's a quiet tantrum, but it is nonetheless a tantrum. And tantrums are for children.
So when somebody is throwing one as an adult through the, the silent treatment, it very much is a manifestation of not only emotional immaturity, but a real lack of interpersonal skill. Because what it really shows is an incapacity to communicate as an adult about something that's uncomfortable. And because narcissists find it so difficult to take personal responsibility for something that they may have said wrong or misunderstood, or they're really not able to find common ground, that lack of interpersonal skill means instead of actually having an evolved adult conversation, they will just simply do the silent treatment, which ultimately is a form of manipulation, which will end up drawing you out and you still have to be the only grown up in the room. Reason number four that can often draw out the silent treatment is dysregulation. And what do I mean by dysregulation? Dysregulation is the inability to regulate emotions in any way. It is why, for example, narcissists are so prone to rage. Something happens to them and they, pum, they blow up instead of, again, having an adult tempered conversation. So when we look at dysregulation with the silent treatment, it's as though there's so much strong, petulant feeling that instead of being able to regulate that feeling, they are actually manifesting this absolutely dysregulated anger by being completely silent. And what it does is it almost creates exactly the same tension as a rage episode would. But because they can't manage strong emotion, they either fully explode or completely withhold. But either way, the emotion is not getting appropriately communicated. And either way, whether rage or silent treatment, it can be experienced as very punitive by the other person in the relationship. A fifth driver of the silent treatment is the chronic victimhood we see in a narcissist. Woe is me. Nothing goes my way. Nobody understands me. I guess I just won't talk. And it can feel very passive aggressive. The victimhood driven silent treatment is something we far more often see in a covert narcissistic pattern. But the silent treatment is a part of every narcissistic pattern I've talked about. For example, in the neglectful narcissistic relationship, the neglectful narcissist lives and dies by the silent treatment. They are almost, it's like permanently what they call home. It's rare that they do talk. The malignant narcissist will often use the the silent treatment as a form of menace or to control you. The covert narcissist, again, from that place of victimhood. But there is this very victimized sense about all kinds of narcissists, magnified in the covert narcissist, but the silent treatment is as though, woe is me, and it becomes sort of this passive aggressive acting out that ultimately leaves you sometimes even taking the blame in these conversations. A final, <coughs> sorry, a final piece of the silent treatment we haven't considered is the talking through model of the silent treatment. And by that I mean, it's a very manipulative tool that I've talked about in other videos where they won't talk to you, but they will talk through other people. Will you please tell your mother that the keys are hanging by the door? Will you please tell your father that I won't be joining him for dinner? So it's kind of sort of a pseudo silent treatment because obviously you can hear what they're saying, but they're making this, this dramatic histrionic show of, I'm not going to talk to them. I'm only going to talk to whomever this third party is. And if you ever grew up like this, and this is a very triangulated theme where one, a narcissistic parent will use you as the child, as the communication device to be able to punish the other spouse with the silent treatment, but then draw their kids into this triangulated space. The silent treatment, although it very much can come through the stonewalling space, gaslighting, emotional immaturity or lack of interpersonal skill, dysregulation and victimhood, that those are really the five primary drivers for why the silent treatment comes through. It can manifest in many different ways. One word answers, absolute silence, talking through other people, and non-response. No matter what, it is a classical part of a narcissistic relationship. Here's the key though, how do you master it? Don't give into it. 
you can outplay them. It's a bit like a staring contest you had as a kid. They're going to give you that silent treatment. You're often going to fall into that trap of maybe this is my fault. Maybe I need to apologize because you just want to break that tension of the silent treatment. You can really train yourself to not give in and say, okay, I can do, I can do a little bit of a post-it world. I can, I can communicate like this because you have put so much time and effort into trying to save this rather broken, often messy relationship. You can out silent treat them. I'm not saying that this is healthy. I think the healthiest path is to communicate in a healthy way. But since they're likely not going to ascribe to that, you can also show yourself the respect and say, I'm certainly not going to blame myself for this. And say that to yourself internally. You don't need to say it to them. And then learn to peaceably exist with them. In fact, I would say you could pretend that if your narcissistic partner or family member is giving you the silent treatment, pretend you're at a silent meditation retreat and try to make the most of it. I don't mean to make light of it, but the fact is the reason narcissists get away with the silent treatment is because it often en we often enable it because we give them the results we want. We apologize, take the blame, take the responsibility, do anything we can to start the conversation again because it's so tense. You can stick this out, but most importantly, view the silent treatment as the red flag that it is. It is a very unhealthy relationship dynamic. And when it happens, the one thing that you should be hearing loudly in the midst of all this silence is that you're looking at one very big red flag. You know, it's interesting with manipulation. This is such a classical dynamic in all narcissistic, high conflict, difficult, and toxic relationships that I actually felt like this word deserved its own entry. And more than a few of you who've been sending in your comments have asked for this specific term. So here it is. So let's start with a dictionary definition of manipulation. The Oxford Dictionary defines manipulate as to control or influence a person or situation cleverly, unfairly, or unscrupulously. Manipulation, by definition, is self-serving. It is an act meant to achieve a goal that the manipulator wants for themselves and that may not be in your best interest. But instead of being transparent about what it is they want and why they need something from you or your help, they attempt to get your buy-in or influence you to support or give in to what it is they want by playing on your vulnerable emotions. What emotions do we have that make us prime for manipulation, guilt, shame, obligation, low self-worth or low self-esteem, confusion, anxiety, fear, a feeling of being not good enough. By playing on these vulnerable spaces that all of us have, it's easy for a manipulative person to manipulate. And if a person is aware that you have a fear of separation or abandonment, then they will play upon that fear. And you may give in to them and what they want to avoid facing that uncomfortable feeling or fear. And that is often one of the most clear ways that manipulation works. It works with us because we want to avoid the thing that makes us uncomfortable, whatever that thing is. To me, guilt is, the, is, in my opinion, is the uncomfortable feeling that people are most trying to avoid. So we go with what the manipulator wants, but sometimes we just don't want to disappoint people. We don't want to let them down. So examples of this could be things like you don't want to feel guilty about sharing your feelings and causing more stress for the narcissist, or so the narcissist says, so you don't share your feelings. You don't bother them with the stuff in your life. You don't want the relationship to end or shift, and so the manipulator says, you know, I don't like you spending so much time with your friends or your family, so I don't know, you work a lot. 
nah, this relationship may not be working for me. And voila, you stop spending time with friends as much or family or working towards your goal so you can avoid feeling that possibility that this relationship could end. In this way, manipulation is a way that somebody takes advantage of our vulnerabilities and our discomfort to set a precedent and then a pattern whereby the narcissistic person, the, the narcissistic pattern of a manipulative person playing upon this. Now, all of that falls under what I might call negative manipulation. A person manipulates us by playing upon our fears or vulnerabilities, even little things. Like I said, our fear of disappointing people or letting them down. It's a more sort of abusive, cruel, mean kind of manipulation. But there's also manipulation, I'm going to call it positive manipulation. It's not positive that it's happening, but it's sort of a fluffing up manipulation. What they may do is a narcissist may use flattery, and they may play upon those things with us, those things that flatter us. Now this technique is more likely to come up during the love bombing phases and the honeymoon phases. They may compliment appearance. Ooh, it looks like you've lost weight or I like how your hair is now, or you look sexy, the, your knowledge, your expertise, your experience. They may compliment anything, but they do it in a way that gets them something they want. So let me give you a very, very simple example. They want to ride to the airport and they'll say, you know, gosh, it's so amazing how nice and giving you are to other people. You are literally the sweetest person I have ever met. There aren't so many giving kind of angels amongst us, like amazing. You're like, okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then a short time later, maybe a day or two, they're like, I, I hate to ask you this because you do so much for other people. Would you mind? driving me to the airport, the Ubers, it's all a big problem. Now, obviously, that's a small example. In a more toxic manner, this can play out as complimenting you in a way that can pull you from doing things that matter to you or that leave you feeling confused about issues about which you may even be ambivalent or conflicted. So perhaps, let's see, maybe you wanted to maintain some part of a career after you had children, and you wanted to attempt to balance the two. But a narcissistic partner may recognize that you working after you have kids could potentially really inconvenience them. <gasps> they may have to pitch in and also give them less control over you. So they may try a positive manipulation and say, <gasps> wow, you are the most amazing mother. What a fantastic mother you are. How lucky is our baby that you're around them 24-7, giving them love and affection. You are so devoted that I would never want to imagine you'd ever want to spend time away from the baby. You deserve, I mean, you really deserve to spend years with the baby and to heal. And it never becomes a conversation about possibly maintaining part of your career. It's not a conversation. It's about them playing on your inner conflict about wanting to be there for your child, but also your conflict about what your career means to you. And boom, they climb into that hole of cognitive dissonance and they turn it around. And at that point, you are already ambivalent. So it's very easy for them to step right in and turn the situation to what they want. Manipulators are masters of playing upon ambivalence in a way that many times you don't recognize as manipulation. But instead, you may identify it as ah, my internal confusion, internal ambivalence. But let me tell you what would have been healthy in this situation. In this situation, it would have been a very real and open and supportive conversation about what you both hope for for your family. You may not even be in 100% agreement, but you may come to a compromise that accounts for both of you rather than the manipulator being internally very clear on what he or she wants, you being at home so they don't need to ever be inconvenienced by childcare issues, and then playing upon your ambivalence to get what they want with the hope that you experience it as what you wanted and zero concern over your process and your hopes.
So yeah, manipulation can either be positive, sort of bluffing you, or negative, you know, sort of playing on your vulnerability. The positive, again, using compliments and praise to really sort of butter you up to get what they want. The negative being playing upon your guilt or other negative emotions or vulnerabilities or your negative self-concept. For example, your sense of not being enough or not wanting to disappoint people to get what they want. Now, manipulation is very frequently a feature of intimate and close relationships with narcissists. Now, and it tends to start really early in the relationship because there's sort of two pathways to manipulation that we've been talking about, the positive and the negative, the flattery versus playing on a person's vulnerabilities. Now, these patterns may evolve over the course of a toxic relationship cycle. Early on, if you have a love bombing phase, or at least the get acquainted phase, the narcissist is doing two things. They may be using love bombing and using flattery to play and playing on that to manipulate you, but they are also doing something else. This is also the mirroring and data gathering phase. When they are collecting information about your vulnerabilities, they start recognizing that you do struggle with guilt and not enoughness and indecisiveness and obligation and not wanting to let people down. And they are going to study that and they're then going to be able to use it in their cruel manipulative processes. Now, anyone who has ever been in a, relation, a close relationship with a narcissist, sort of a marriage, a fiance, boyfriend, girlfriend, understands this fundamentally. Manipulation is a core dynamic in these relationships. And it is a primary contributor to the sort of the destabilization that comes from narcissistic abuse because it leaves a person chronically confused, wondering if anything in the relationship is ever in their best interest. And here's the rub. Because manipulation is solely designed to forward what the manipulator wants, the only time it's going to be good for you as the manipulatee is those occasions when both of you, by sheer luck, just happen to have your interests and timing aligned. In other words, they are en engaging in manipulative behavior, let's say to foster your agreement with something they want, but in some cases it may be exactly what you want to. That's not a healthy relationship. That's luck. Now, family manipulation manifests in so many ways, quite often and classically through triangulation. In a family system, the narcissist wants what he or she wants. And this is often apparent. So the entire family system becomes a bit of a chessboard or a puppet show in which the narcissist in charge is pulling the strings and everyone is puppeteered as objects for the narcissist. As a child raised in this kind of a family system, you know this well. Their, their manipulation, the manipulation on behalf of your parents that your parents do, often means that you do not even know who you are because having your own sense of self wasn't even permitted. You were almost raised to be a source of narcissistic supply or of scapegoating or of service for your parent. The opportunity for you to develop your sense of self as a unique, healthy person is totally going to get thwarted. Now, as you get older, you recognize this, and much of the struggle is to do the deep dive and figure out who you are away from the manipulation. But if you are stuck in that family dynamic, it can be very hard to distance yourself from the manipulative dynamic and figure out what it is you want, who you are, and what you are about. The manipulation in essence, so the manipulation in essence is using the members of the family to serve the narcissist's needs. And to me, this is one of the most damaging elements of the narcissistic family dynamic because it almost robs some people of some sense of healthy identity. 
Now in workplace settings, manipulation, whether from the management and leadership or from your colleagues, is a standard element of toxic workplaces. Now it can take many forms, just as it does in close relationships or family relationships. Things could include fostering guilt to get staff to buy in on unpleasant tasks or additional workload. All right, gang, we are all in this together. I mean, we can handle those pay cuts, right? All the while, the administrators are getting well paid while you endure that pay cut. Or they butter you up as a pathway to make you work more, out, work more hours or suggesting that a promotion you get, they're going to give you a new title, but no more compensation. And then they'll tell you that this position is going to put you in place for bigger and better things down the line. So they're doing future faking. Manipulative leaders learn their staff's and their employees' vulnerabilities, and they often exploit them. Manipulative workplaces are also really triangulated, and some people in these workplaces benefit a lot more than other people, often because the ones who get ahead are the ones that are the best at fluffing up the narcissistic boss. So now we've already talked about this, talked about it in this series, so I'm not going to belabor it, but gaslighting is the ultimate manipulation. Denying someone's reality is a manipulation designed to destabilize them, confuse them, and often results in the gaslighted person just giving in from a place of confusion, self-doubt, helplessness, or hopelessness. Gaslighting can kind of be nested under manipulation. Not all manipulation is gaslighting, but all gaslighting is manipulation. So this goes into a bit of a philosophical question. It's one I actually struggle with even with my students and sometimes with my clients. If a person is not intentionally or consciously manipulating, is it still manipulation? Now this is a tough one. First of all, there is no way to really know. We have to trust the truth of the manipulator, and we already know that they're not good truth tellers, or let's just say it, they often lie. They're not going to come out and say, yeah, I was intentionally manipulating you. When we talk not just about narcissism, but about all of the high conflict, antagonistic, and difficult personality styles that all hang out together, and these things all together are often collectively termed, it's an old school term, but they're collectively termed cluster B patterns. All of these patterns all show a lack of social and interpersonal skills. These are people who are not particularly good at empathy, not particularly good at intimacy, not particularly good at self-reflection. There's a selfishness to these cluster B patterns in which they're sort of single-mindedly focused on doing what works for them with little regard for other people. But this lack of social skill of not being able to understand the back and forth or the reciprocity of human relationship can mean that they're going to do and they're going to say whatever they need to do to serve themselves. Now manipulation gets tricky because we have to at some part level own our part in it. Now I am not and I do not want to engage in blaming the victim here. So this is, I'm, I'm sort of walking in a tricky space here. But the fact is we all, all of us have elements. Our propensity for guilt, our sense of hope, our normal human appreciation for being validated that can leave us more vulnerable to being manipulated. So when a person engages in some kind of passive aggressive prattle about something, I don't know, coming to a work event or working late on a deadline or loaning someone money. When they go on about some of these things and get very passive aggressive in those spaces, it can thrum on our ancient scripts of issues such as guilt. Oh, okay, sure, I'll give you money, but I struggle a lot too. And then the difficult personality plays upon those less than healthy parts of us. Guilt, obligation, misplaced sense of duty. And that's when it becomes the perfect storm. The manipulator meets the 
manipulatable. And I think most of us are manipulatable. But let's go back to the philosophical question. Does it matter if it is intentional or not? I'm going to be frank with you. If you ask enough psychologists, you're going to get an entire range of opinions. In some ways, we're never going to find out if it's intentional. So all we can do is look for patterns. People who are not self-reflective and who have very variable empathy and who are not interpersonally wise may easily engage in behavior that feels manipulative. However, however, if you clearly communicate with someone and they take responsibility and stop and catch themselves, I don't know, maybe that doesn't qualify as manipulation. They themselves may acknowledge that they learned some of these manipulative patterns in childhood and they fall back on them. But that if it's not consistently a pattern and a genuine intentional effort is made to change it, it's actually not likely to be the kind of antagonistic manipulation we observe in a pattern such as narcissism. Narcissistic manipulation is not going to go away. In fact, it may be the one pattern that is the most resistant to change. So why do narcissists manipulate? I mean, at a core level, it is a manifestation, as I noted earlier in this particular video, it's a manifestation of their inability to communicate clearly within the context of a relationship and their anxious need to protect their core insecurity and address their own needs first. There's a certain lack of trust that the narcissistic personality style has with the world at large. So manipulation allows them to control the narrative. Instead of having to trust someone to do the right thing or agree to do something, they maintain control, which is very important for them to maintain control, by setting things up in a way that, are gonna, that will result in exactly the outcome that they want or that they need. Manipulation works when you don't care about another person. It's, it's disrespectful. And narcissistic personalities have so much contempt for close relationships that their disrespect is manifested through manipulation. I mean, in fact, is manipulation is an acknowledgement that another person is merely an object by which to get things done or an impediment or a barrier to be removed. Now, sadly, people who grow up in narcissistic family environments often learn manipulation as a way, as, as one of the only ways to actually be in a relationship. And even healthy people from these families of origin may need to sort of unlearn manipulation as a way of interacting with people. We do what we're brought up with. It's hard sometimes to undo those patterns. Manipulation feels awful when it happens to us. We feel played. We feel disrespected. But manipulation also plays on our own negative emotions and our own vulnerabilities. So we have to balance, we have to balance boundary setting and saying no in the face of the manipulation. And then we have to endure the uncomfortable emotions that manipulation raises, such as guilt. Now, manipulation honestly raises the biggest issue for boundary setting or even walking away from narcissistic relationships. People just don't know how to do it because they're confused. Now, we recognize, we may recognize that the narcissistic relationship and the manipulation are all unhealthy. But our discomfort over feeling guilty can keep us stuck. And in that way, for reasons that aren't always clear, people choose resentment, I'm going to stay in this, over guilt. Neither one feels good. But for some reason, people often choose resentment and stay in the relationship, which sadly over time can leave you feeling like a victim.
Now, manipulation is a classical dynamic in all high conflict and antagonistic relationships and a fixture in narcissistic relationships. I've actually never heard of the narcissistic relationship dynamic without it. In many ways, manipulation is the language that they speak. And as a result, you have to fall back on the tried and true strategies of realistic expectations, radical acceptance, not engaging, not explaining, and setting boundaries while doing a deep dive into yourself, learning yourself, and starting to identify issues like your guilt, your need to please other people as a barrier that you can address. We know, we already know, that narcissists do not respect boundaries. But if you can get a handle on some of the stuff that keeps you stuck, like guilt, or a distorted sense of duty and obligation or false narratives and fear, you can start learning the superpower of avoiding manipulation and doing it with compassion and with grace. Sometimes, quite often actually, no is the hardest word to say, and yet it may save your life. Manipulation is really one of those challenging, the most challenging dynamic in narcissistic relationships. And many people have to see it happen hundreds, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of times to really recognize it for what it is and finally set the real boundaries or step away from the relationship as a means to their own survival. Today we're going to talk about gaslighting. It is a word that everybody is talking about, but not everyone is exactly sure of what it means. And trust me, for those of you who have experienced it, and most of you experienced it, you'll know it when it happens. But simply put, it is having your emotions and your reality denied. So I'm going to run you through some classical statements, the kinds of words people use when they're gaslighting you. So here are some of the classics. Stop being so sensitive. That never happened. I think you may be mentally ill. You need help. Why can't you take a joke? Why are you always so angry? Why can't you let go of the past? No one is ever going to love you the way I do. It doesn't sound like what you just did was that difficult. It sounds like you are exaggerating. I am sorry you choose to make yourself feel that way. There is nothing that warrants you feeling that way. You have no right to feel that way. Actually, you don't really feel that way. Let me tell you how you do feel. Other people have it so much harder than you. Stop being a victim. And to everyone out there on YouTube, if you have some more examples of gaslighting statements you've heard or experienced, please drop them below in the comments because it's always good for us to keep a library of gaslighting taglines so you know what's happening to you. So exactly what is gaslighting? Let's start with where the term comes from. It originates from a play that later became a film in the 1930s called Gaslight. In the film, the husband keeps turning the old-fashioned gas lights up and down. And when she asks him who is turning the lights up and down, he denies it's happening. He tells her he doesn't think that they're any less bright than they were before. She slowly starts to doubt her own reality. Then she loses her grip on reality, and then she goes insane. Simply put, gaslighting is the doubting of another person's reality, deliberate or not. It can be done by that long variety of phrases that I read to you above. By saying something, then denying it. By promising something and then denying the promise. Over time, the gaslighted person feels confused and full of self-doubt. Gaslighting can be manifested in a variety of ways, so let's break them down. First, let's talk about classical gaslighting. 
This involves straight up denial of your reality. That never happened. You have no right to feel that way. Every single narcissistic relationship I have ever worked with, counseled, or consulted on had some gaslighting present. It's a given in a narcissistic or toxic relationship. It results in the narcissist holding all of the power in the relationship because they hold the reality. It leaves you full of self-doubt, second-guessing, confusion, and when you are focusing all of your energies on trying to get your own reality sorted, the narcissist can do a good job of continuing to confuse you. Gaslighting is obviously manipulation, emotional abuse, and it sets a tone for the relationship. One classical book about this is called, He Said the Sky Was Purple. And that is how gaslighting works. Not only is your reality denied, you start accepting the reality of the other person. The second kind of gaslighting is withholding. I'm not going to talk to you if you bring that up again. This results over time in silencing yourself in a relationship for fear that your other needs will not be met. Fear, for example, that you will lose the relationship and then also a pattern of doubting yourself and wondering if there is something wrong with you for bringing up a topic. Anyone who has ever been from a family of origin where this kind of emotional abuse was taking place or any other physical or sexual abuse, you know this dynamic too well. And for a child to hear that if you bring something up again, that you would lose the love or support or safety of a significant adult, such a parent, it can be terrifying. This kind of gaslighting can result in going into adulthood feeling that you are not allowed to speak about your own needs. And as you can guess, that can be a perfect setup for getting into and staying in a relationship with a narcissist as an adult. The third kind of gaslighting is contradicting. This involves screwing with your sense of reality by telling you that you did not remember a situation correctly. Actually, your mother was at the party. Or, I met you after my wife moved out of the house. Or, you had already said that you didn't want to come to my birthday party when I changed the date. Contradicting can leave you wanting to do things like check old emails, voicemails, and text messages. You may look at old photographs to actually confirm whether indeed your mother was actually at the party. You start feeling like a private detective in your own life. The fourth kind of gaslighting is diversion. This involves changing the subject to something that makes them, the narcissist, look good and makes you look irresponsible or like a bad person. For example, I remember that time I had to run to the school to get Johnny when he broke his arm while you were too busy to be there for him because you were at work. Or when you bring up cheating or infidelity, they will then bring up something that you may have felt ashamed about from your past. For example, perhaps you confided in your partner that you once cheated on a high school ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, and they will twist it into that. Or they will try to play the guilt card and bring up their own dramas, their work problems, their health issues, their money problems, and the troubles they are having with their family to garner pity and distract away from a feeling that you are sharing. The fifth type of gaslighting is gaslighting that involves minimization or sort of dampening of your feelings. This is when they will tell you you're being petty for focusing on such a small issue or trying to make you feel like less of a person while framing it as other people having it so much worse than you. You are really going to stand here in our big comfortable house that I worked so hard for us and complain that I was flirting with someone when there are people out there that are homeless? By the time you make sense of that, you're like, what? Gaslighting is all about moving the goalposts, which the narcissists do all the time. They shift your reality and they change the rules mid-game, or they have one set of rules for themselves and another set of rules for you and other people. When you try to bring up this inconsistency, they will either insult you or label you as petty. In many ways, 
it can feel really nitpicky. I often say that gaslighting is sort of the way that lawyers argue. They go after that one little thing designed to win the argument because for narcissists, it is all about winning. They do not care that it is cruel to you or dissolves the intimacy and closeness in the relationship as long as they win. In one story, a guy was snagged in the parking lot of a motel where his wife had seen the woman she has suspected him of having an affair with, and she had seen that woman had gone in earlier. When she confronted him, and in fact could even see the other woman getting into her car on the other side of the lot, she said, there you go, I finally caught you in bed with your girlfriend. And you know what he responded? He said, no you didn't, you just found me in a parking lot, and there is a mall over there. I don't know what your problem is, you need to get some psychiatric help. I suppose legally he was right. She did only see him in a parking lot and only speculated that he was in bed with someone else. But after seeing all the texts and emails and all the rest of it, she knew that wasn't the case. But this is cruel. What he did was cruel. And life is not a court of law. Physical gaslighting happens when physical violence starts to creep into the relationship. This may happen when the narcissistic partner, for example, may strongly grab another person's arm. And when the person whose arm was grabbed reacts to it, the narcissist will say, stop exaggerating. It didn't really hurt. Stop being so sensitive. And on top of that, at this point, you're probably often feeling a lot of terror. Two other forms of gaslighting include gaslighting by proxy and gaslighting by tribe. Gaslighting by proxy occurs when someone else does the gaslighting for the narcissist. And since you know how good and how often other people enable narcissists, these enablers become gaslighters for the narcissist as well. Examples of this would be one parent making excuses for the narcissistic parent's behavior. Your father didn't really mean that. Or other employees in your workplace making excuses for a toxic supervisor. Hey, listen, we're the most profitable office in the region. He may be a tough talker, but he's just trying to push all of us to be our best. Or the friend of a toxic spouse making an excuse. Go ahead and give him another chance. He really is a good guy. Gaslighting by tribe is, in essence, a form of enabling. It is when you are faced down by the network of people around you and around the narcissist and who turn around and tell you that what you are experiencing didn't happen. I have consulted on many cases where people were subjected to invalidation, harassment, intimidation, and other verbal abuse in work settings, and even had solid documentation. In most cases, other people in the workplace were saying things like, it isn't that bad, or her bark is worse than her bite, which is a horrible feeling. Gaslighting by tribe happens in families all of the time, especially when there is abuse. The victim or victims of abuse in a family or the scapegoats in a family are not heard. And the family will often close ranks and tell them that they are disloyal for criticizing the father or the grandfather or the aunt or the mother, whomever the perpetrator was. And then they will talk about how lucky they are to be in this family. And obviously, gaslighting by tribe can happen in a couple. Your friends try and minimize how bad your relationship is. For example, they may say things like, marriage is hard. All relationships go through rough spots. And most people who gaslight by tribe don't want the inconvenience of your divorce or separation from the family because they don't want to have to choose sides. They don't really care about you. They are doing what works for them. Kids are very susceptible to gaslighting because they aren't quite yet cynical enough to understand that people could be this manipulative. Children don't feel safe questioning parents and will often succumb to the skewed reality of the narcissistic parent. Gaslighting bosses can harm your career and your mental health, or you may take the fall for a boss's error or the error of someone that the boss or the workplace wants to protect. While it is happening and everyone is gaslighting you at the same time, you feel like you have walked 
into the matrix. And when the tribe is gaslighting you, you'll see that you likely will not have a legal leg to stand on to protect yourself. There is a flip side to gaslighting too. You may start gaslighting yourself. After having to numb yourself for so long and to live in confusion for so long, you may find yourself denying your own emotions, saying something like, I don't feel anything. This isn't upsetting me. After years of being gaslighted, you learn to gaslight yourself. Why do narcissists gaslight? The same reason they do everything, to protect their fragile egos. Other people's realities are a threat to their own. They construct their version of reality that allows them to maintain their false sense of power. And because the narcissist narratives are inflexible, they are not willing to integrate other people's perspectives, which is why they so often come off as pig-headed and stubborn. If you are in pain and they may be in responsibility, if you are in pain and they may be responsible in part for your pain, they sure as hell don't want to deal with that uncomfortable feeling, so they don't. They simply tell you that you aren't having that feeling, you're not in pain. And their fragility means that they're threatened by other people's feelings and realities. And so they don't make room for them and they deny them outright. How convenient for them and how abusive for you. So why do we fall for it? Why do we fall for gaslighting? Why don't we just walk away the first time that someone gaslights us or say a few choice obscene words to them? There are a few reasons and vulnerabilities. First, if you grew up being gaslighted, you already doubt your reality. After a lifetime of gaslighting, it is almost normalized and you accept it as part of a human relationship. Second is the fact that most of you are nice people and you create rationalizations or you offer people second chances believing that they really didn't or couldn't possibly mean it. Third, for too many people, especially those who are frightened of abandonment or just do not recognize their own reality, there is the fear of losing the narcissist if you call them out. Or at least you may be concerned about being perceived as arrogant or narcissistic yourself if you actually said something. Fourth, most people don't know gaslighting is a thing and after seeing this video you no longer have that excuse. It is a classical form of emotional abuse and yet we don't tell and teach people about it. Most people when I point out to them that they were gaslighted they'll say what's that? And then in a matter of minutes, 30 years of a confusing marriage, starts to make sense. So what are we supposed to do if we're gaslighted? Obviously in the best case scenario you see it as the red neon flag that it is and you walk away. That's not always an option. So I tell people to internally stand their ground. As always, don't get in the mud with them. Don't defend yourself. Don't react. Just learn that little Mona Lisa smile. Reveal nothing on your face give a little head bob like that and do not give up on your own reality. Hold it internally and make a mental note that you were just gaslighted. Once a person does it once, they will do it again. It is a wake up call that you should not share your vulnerability with this person. You shouldn't share your intellectual property or your fears or anything. They will weaponize all of it and use it against you. What shouldn't you do? Don't try to bring them over to your way of thinking. That is a mistake that many people make in narcissistic relationships when they're being gaslighted. Everyone wants to explain themselves to the narcissist and then they think everything will be okay. This is a huge mistake to do this. Narcissists are masters at gaslighting and they don't give a darn about your reality. Once you pull out your phone to show them the text messages that show them that they were gaslighting you, they don't step back and say, oh my goodness, I am so sorry, you were right, I did say that. Instead, they'll double down and gaslight you some more and tell you that you are a petty little person who fights dirty and that in fact, they're doing you a favor by putting up with your sorry, pathetic self. So now you just got gaslighted twice. 
don't explain yourself. And then there's what I call the gaslighting test. One sure fire way that you know you're being gaslighted. You want to know how that works? When you start pulling out text messages, emails, and voice recordings during arguments on a regular basis to make your point, you know you're being gaslighted. You start recording everything because you don't trust yourself anymore because your reality has been confused many times. Once you start doing that, you know you're being gaslighted. If you are being gaslighted, then you are being emotionally abused. If you can't leave, at least be aware that this is a real thing and that it's happening and find other sources of support to be accurate mirrors and reality checks. Stop handing your reality over to the narcissist. And then the next time they say the sky is purple, just smile in them, just smile at them in that sad way. We smile at people who just don't get it and say, I'm sure it'll be a mighty nice sunset tonight. And then wink at that blue sky above you and own that it is blue. Your reality is sacred. Don't pawn it off on a narcissist.